Hi there friends and welcome to my tutorial gameplay run for RimWorld. I'm Icon and this video series is a fully guided experience which where I will explain basically everything along the way I do and this series is meant for players that are completely new to the game and want to understand how everything works and yeah that's basically what we're up to. This game is going to be recorded with the version 1.3 of RimWorld, the newest version that is available. So this is also my opportunity to introduce all the new content that the game has to offer with the newest version. I also will play 100% without mods. So this is a complete vanilla experience to be accessible to everybody who's completely new to the game. The only thing which will be included here will be the royalty DLC because I don't want to turn that off. It's a nice addition and it doesn't alter the game too much. So to get started we need to found a new colony and let's press that button. Over here we get to decide which starting scenario we will take. The crash landed scenario is the most balanced and common experience and we're going to play that one in this tutorial series. There's also different backgrounds available from a lost medieval tribe to a complete naked start without anything. These are very different gameplay experiences. We're going to start with three people equipped with a couple of with a couple of items, money, food, weapons, we have what we need to establish a good foothold. So we're going to get into that. And now we get to select our AI storyteller. The storyteller defines how events and problems are being tossed towards your colony. Cassandra features a very balanced gameplay curve, whereas Phoebe has well, a very flat curve with low amounts of threat events, but she scales up eventually to hit as hard as Cassandra and the infamous Randy Random who just spawns events as he wants to. We're going to play with Cassandra and I'm going to use as a difficulty level the Blood and Dust difficulty, which is meant for experienced players who want to struggle to survive. If you are new to the game, by all means, go to lower difficulties, but for the sake of the tutorial, I want to have a pretty high difficulty level. The difficulty levels reflect how hard it will be to keep your people happy, alive, and how hard the enemies will attack. When you check out the custom settings down here, you can adjust everything as you want it for your game, like how much yield your plants will have, how much yield your animals will have when you butcher them, and so on and so forth. Because I personally hate friendly fire in this game, I'm going to disable this here altogether. Because I gotta admit, this is really... Well, I'm going to explain that along the road why I do this. So, as you see here, the blood and dust difficulty that I have marked in has a slightly lower amount of yields, but that's just basically to make me a little bit more happy. Beyond that, I don't want to explain these things too much. If you are completely new to the game, choose the settings that you feel good with. Peaceful excludes the combat system altogether. You just get attacked by wild animals. Whereas Adventure Story and Community Builder are pretty good if you want to have some raiders. And Strive to Survive is pretty good when you know how the game works and you just want to be challenged for the first time. Okay. Now that's after that's been said and done, we're going to go into reload anytime mode. Commitment mode forbids you to save the game. We're not going to use that for a tutorial series. Over here, we get to use a world seed, introduce whatever word you want, and we get to configure how the world looks like. Globe coverage is is giving is well. I want to show it. It's way easier to explain it. So world coverage, this number depicts how much of the globe is covered by land mass. 30% is all you need, you really don't need more than that. Here you can adjust the climate, just how you want it to be. We're going to stick with default settings. Over here we can configure how many different factions there are on this planet. I'm not too interested in changing up anything here because basically every planet is playable. Now we get to select where we will be living. This thing looks quite overwhelming at first, but believe me, 
it's quite simple to be understood. This is the world where we're going to play at. This world is divided in hexagon tiles and every hexagon tile is a place where you can live. As you see here other factions are building their towns on these tiles as well and when you want to select where you want to live you can click here to let the terrain informations pop up. So there's temperate forest, temperate swamp, there's boreal forest, deserts, tundra, lots of different biomes to live at. We will start with the temperate forest biome because that's the most balanced and simple approach to the game, especially when you're new to the game. When you want to make it especially easy to trade with neighbors, try to settle next to the people with the purple house icon. The yellow tents are well, no, let's start from the beginning. The purple house icon depicts the Civil Outlander Union, which are people that are at industrial level and sell really good items. The yellow tent are tribal people and they won't sell high-tech items, so I personally prefer to be living closer to these people than to these people because, you know, guns are really important in this game. Beyond that, if you play with royalty, there's also this uh, pillar icon which depicts the settlements of the royal faction. So I think this cluster here is quite good. We have two towns to trade with, two towns of the imperial faction one day to trade with and there's even friendly tribal people over here and well at the end of the day there's a also a hostile tribe here which we can make friends with I'd say this is a good spot to live at when you pick it, uh, up the terrain you see here how fl uh, the the flatness or well how mountainous it is how hard it is to move over the field this is only important while you're traveling the stone types merely cosmetic mostly elevation don't mind that average temperature this is an interesting spot the higher the average temperature the less uh, the the higher the growing period at this tile you see we can grow stuff at 40 of 60 days a year in room world is only 60 days if you go down here though where you see the temperatures are on average higher the growing period would be year-round so if you don't want to experience winters you just need to go south so i personally like to go for tiles that have at least a little bit of mountains and no caves because in caves there will be monsters and if you are completely new to the game you better avoid those although it's not that terribly hard to live with that we're going to go to this tile here we have large hills marble of light and limestone we have a average temperature between one degree and 30 degree so it's not even going to be freezing in, in the winter time and that's all we need to do here we can also configure if we want to have a different size of a map i personally can only say i never played any different size than a medium map and i was always happy with that and i have 2000 hours in this game under my buckle so it's up to you i just want to lose a few words about larger maps they stress your cpu a lot more and the game will get laggy a lot quicker beyond that go crazy it's your world and your rules so we're going to get over here and now we get to select our people to play with this is the next point where you can get easily overwhelmed but it's only looking complicated it's just not too hard so here we see the most important thing and that's what our people can do over here we see what they won't do and here we see what they well the character traits are overall you see down here also a summary of what your team can do and here we can randomize these people as a rule of thumb you want to have a constructor at the beginning at all costs Try to avoid incapabilities if you are new to the game. Try to roll people which are just incapable of nothing, because that's the best you can do. And beyond that, a constructor is absolutely mandatory. These flame icons you see here depict how fast somebody will learn a skill. If you don't have any flames, they learn quite slowly. And the more flames they have, the faster they learn their trade. Also, they will be happy while doing these works. That's also pretty important to notice. So down here at the traits section, you see what these people want to do. I personally wouldn't say there's anything really bad there. 
just roll with it and play as you want it to. So once we have a construction dude, I also want to emphasize that combat values are pretty cool to have, but not a must have. We're going to stick with Emanuel and say we have a constructor for the settlement and that's really cool. The next thing we need is somebody who's good with plants. Plants is depicting how good you can cut trees, sow out fields, harvest fields, and basically people with a high skill in plants are really, really good to create food with. So here we have Pi, Samuel Pi. Well, okay, Samuel Blants actually, but whatever. Very good constructor. It never hurts to have more than one constructor. Good with plants and very good with intellectual. Intellectual is research, so I don't mind. He's incapable of social work, so he won't be ever talking to people for diplomatic reasons, nor will he take care of prisoners, but we're going to be okay with that. As a psychopath, he doesn't mind grimy work too much, let's call it like that. The pessimist gives him some mood debuff, but we're going to explain these things when they go, when they turn interesting. So now we got construction and plants. What's important beyond that? Really important in my opinion is to have yet another thing, and that's a cook. Every settlement should have at least one cook, because processed food is just so much better than unprocessed food. Well, we're going to see what we can do here really love to have somebody who's not suffering from Alzheimer's. Well, over here at the health bar, try to avoid people who are addicted to something, because that really is quite difficult to handle, especially when you're new to the game. Some scars and such are not too bad, because they will just make people a little bit angry from time to time, because they they suffer from pain. Here, I want to have somebody who's good with cooking and good with animals. That's the stuff that I really want to have as, uh, as a finisher. The animal skill allows you to tame animals and, and harvest them and tend to them, train them even to a point where you can use them as a, as a attack force. So we're going to roll here until we are happy. Sometimes this takes a quite a while. I personally also love to just uh, go with a completely randomized bunch of people. This can be also very, very fun. What I want to say with that is don't take the initial rolls too serious. Very easily you can over-optimize things here, and that's not entirely necessary. You can work out with really horrible people as well. But the most important thing is that you should try to avoid people that are incapable of medical work, because they will basically let people die on the floor because they are unwilling to bandage them. And this is really bad. I personally avoid these guys like crazy. So we're going to roll up a character I don't want in cataracts frail and bad back frailty and bad back makes the person really slow try to avoid these conditions as well now that's looking quite good bubbles is going to be incapable of violence i would personally try to re-roll that now but it's okay we have a passionate doctor we have somebody well he's not a really good doctor this would be not an ideal beginner's package but i will feature them nevertheless because they are really good to depict the ups and downs of that. Okay, so when we look down here, we now have passionate people at every spot, except for shooting and mining. Shooting and mining are not that, well, it's really good to have good shots, but it's not that mandatory. Mining is, well, it's a good bonus, but it's not important for your survival like crazy, because Everybody is capable of doing anything unless it's stated clearly that they are incapable of it. So what I want to say with that is these people might not like mining, but they will eventually do it and learn it nevertheless. So now here we are. This is the main screen where we can see where people landed. This is the stuff we had. We are starting with the money, the food, the weapons, all the things that we need to survive with. So. As the first thing we need to do, as you see here, there's this red X dotting out the crossing out the these items, which means our people are not allowed to use this. When you click your colonists and right-click things, 
you get a context menu which shows you what you can do with these things. We can equip wood uh, logs, we can consume packaged survival meals, we can equip bolt action rifles and so on and so forth. The red X only means that your people won't interact with these items automatically. You will be still able to force the interaction with these. For example, we now want to equip these weapons, so Pi gets to get the gets to equip the bolt action rifle. So we do this, right click on that and then left click on the equipment and same goes for the revolver, right click on that while we have Emmanuel selected and then we turn on the time and watch them equip that. All right, so since I don't want to allow everything manually, we go into the architect menu, the orders section and here you find forbid and allow tools. You can put this now on your cursor and then drag and drop it with the left mouse button or you simply right click the allow for, uh, the allow button and unforbid all items and boom, there you go. Everything now is allowed to work with. So since RimWorld is a lot about survival, we're going to think about survival now. There's a couple of things that you might want to think about. First off, you want to decide where you guys, where your people will put up their colony. I personally like to set myself up in an area where I can defend one side of this place really good and lock off the rest with walls. There's a ton of different things that you can that you can think about here, like. If there are resources there, what kind of fertility the soil has, and a lot of things. But here we want to focus simply on defendability and some other things. And I consider this cluster here looks like it's going to be very easy to defend. We just need to put a wall here and we're locked off. We just need to put up a wall here and we're locked off. And we just need to put up a wall somewhere here or over here to be locked off there as well. And then we can fight off all enemies that come from this angle. Pretty good. So we're going to start here some, somewhat. It's also completely okay if you're new to this game and just settle where you want to. Don't get, don't overstress the decisions at the beginning because you can always resettle later. So the first thing that we want to do is to create a spot where all these items lying around can be stored at because everything which is lying outside will be deteriorating if it's lying not under a roof and when it's lying outdoors. So we want to put up a stockpile. To do so we go into the architect menu, select the zone menu and check out these purple zones. The stockpile zone is the area which your people will store stuff at. So we select that, get it into the cursor and drag and drop it. Well, something like a nine on nine or 10 on 10 spot will be okay. So this is now our stockpile zone. When we select somebody now and right click the package survival meals now, now we can prioritize hauling. This point is now available because we have a stockpile zone. And when we do this, you see our folks will now start hauling stuff onto the stockpile zone. Things will be still deteriorating though, because we don't have a roof and we don't have, uh, and we are still outdoors. So let's change that. Into the architect menu we go and into the structure menu. The structure menu features walls, doors, and lots of other things we'll be talking about later. What we now need, what we need now is the wall. With a wall, you can click that and then you can select what material it should be made of. Here you will get only, this will always only show materials that you actually own. So later on when we own stones, when we click that, we get also to, to select stone walls. Things that have this interaction menu are called in RimWorld stuffable items. This means that they can, build, can be built out of different stuff. You find that in various items, like beds can be made out of different materials, chairs can be made out of different materials. This is all what we call stuffable items, because it can be made out of stuff. <laughs> so we're going to start out with wooden walls and draw now a couple of walls around our stockpile zone. Here we go. Now our dudes will build a wall around that, but because that's not too cool to have only walls, we're going to also put a door inside there. As you see here, the door is also buildable out of different materials. 
you figure. So, your colonists will always try to work automatically. At all points they will try to work automatically, but to give them a sense of more or well to teach them what to prioritize we need to, to use the work order menu over here you see what kind of work a person will do or won't do this is just a system where you can put a check mark like we can now tell bubbles to do the handling work or not the priorities are from left to right which means Whenever Emmanuel is done with his task, he will check, is there a fire to quench? No, then he will track, check, is there a pay, am I needing treatment? Am I, do I need to be a patient? No, all right. Is there anybody needing treatment? No, all right. Do I need sleep? No, all right. Is there any basic task? No, all right, and so forth. So basically, this is just a check mark system where they check from left to right what kind of work they can do. Since I really don't like the simplicity of this, we're going to use the advanced menu uh, the advanced menu here. But if you are new to this and what I'm doing now is too confusing to you, this is really okay to work with to begin with, but I personally like this one more because here we can set up priorities for every work. So basically what we do here now is we tell everybody that we want firefighting as a top notch thing so we left click it and increase the priority right clicking it will be decreasing the priority so priority one mean, means that this is the most important thing to do so basically what this does would be well let's put this like this and make this like that so this configuration means the following Emmanuel will check after each work is there a fire to quench yes or no and then he will head right over to the next priority one thing is there something to haul yes or no then he will start hauling and only and really only if there's nothing to haul left he will try and go with the priority three things i, I think that's quite uh, understandable but i wanted to explain that thoroughly because this is your management center where you can automate tasks Another really useful thing is if you hold down the shift button and left click the header here, you see you can, or right click it, you can change the priority for everybody. So we're going to make it like that. I always have priority one on firefighting because I really want fires to be quenched as quick as possible. On patienting as well because I want these people to lay down in a bed if they are, if they are wounded. I want to have a minimum priority of four on everybody who's capable of doctoring. I'm going to explain uh, why later. Bed rest also on a priority one and basic. Basic is flicking switches, releasing prisoners and refueling things. This is really important. These are always at a priority of one but, uh, for me, except for doctoring where only good doctors have the top priority. Beyond that, we're going to do it now like that. Emmanuel will be my chief hauler, so he's going to carry stuff. Or, well, no, no, we're going to make it like that. Emmanuel will be my plant cutter for now. Or, no, we're going to make him the constructor. Pi will be cutting the plants, and Bubbles will be hauling the items. We're going to reconfigure that in the course of this series several times, but now we have uh, talked about the fundamentals, and that should be enough. So what this now does is that Emmanuel is going to try to focus on construction as much as possible, which means he's carrying this wood over to this place, and now he's building stuff. He's a little bit pukey because he's uh, having a crypto sleep sickness, resulting from him being dropped from the sky. Background things, you know, background things. So as you see here now, our dudes are doing their best to build that building just like I told them to. Beginning with the walls, removing the trees in the way there, and carrying the items into the designated stockpile zone. All right. So now the walls are done. Once the walls are done, the game will always try to put a roof over this room. If you check out the zoning tool here, you can have, when you look at these yellow buttons here, build roof, remove roof, and ignore roof. You see here, when you click the build roof button, you get a highlighter where the game wants to build roofs anyways. As you see here, this room is supposed to be roofed, and now they are removing the, these uh, nasty trees there. 
and starting to put roofs on that. Roofs don't cost any material, they are for free, and now after that's been done, the, f the things that have changed are this room is now supposed as our is now a indoors room if you check out here where i have my cursor on the right side of the map outdoors and indoors this means now that that this is a locked room which qualifies as a storage you see here the deterioration is no longer shown because this stuff is now saved uh, uh, stored safely okay but RF people won't be happy by just having a storage room. What do they need? Of course, some place to sleep. So we're going to put up another structure here. We're going to into the structure menu, fetch up new wooden walls, and place down a new block kind structure. And I'm going to give a single room to everybody. So these are two rooms. Since we are three people, we need a third room. You can waste, you can spend a lot of thought into how to organize these sleeping rooms. I'm not going to talk too much about that. The most important things here are every room needs a door. And uh, at the end of the day, your people need a bed in that room. That's the absolute minimum a person needs. You can rotate items with Q and E as you see here or by just clicking these uh, buttons and we now have set up everything as we want to. One thing though we will be running out of wood soon because we only have 104 logs of wood stored here and this won't be enough to, to begin with. So we're going over into the architect menu again, select the order section and do the chop wood thing. You can select this by left clicking and putting this tool onto your cursor. Now if we drag and drop that over the trees, we will cut all trees that yield wood. As you see here, a few trees like this guy here are not getting designated. This is because this one is not grown enough to yield any wood and the chop wood order does only chop away trees that yield wood. If you just want to remove a tree, the cut plants job is what you need to do. Okay, so now we can uh, fast forward a little bit because now we're ch chopping these trees. I configured to uh, I configured Pi to do that. He's doing the growing work, which is the field work, and the plant cutting work, which is just plant cutting. Also chopping trees. So this way we have all we need to get started with. The other jobs here in the in the section I will explain once they are necessary. But for now, everything is quite okay. As you see here, Bubbles is not doing too much because there's not, not much work for her to do. Another thing here are these stone blocks. These chunks here will be later used to cut stones with. To get rid of them, we need the zoning tool again and we create a dumping stockpile zone. This is basically like a junkyard. A chunk or a junkyard, as you, however you want to put it. We're going to create a large zone here and as you see here, these limestone chunks are already lying in there. And now we can select those and haul things. You can either do the hauling like here over the borders menu by just putting that on your cursor. You can just click those guys and select it. Or you can double click them to select all of them visible on your screen, however you want it to do. What they will do then is they will haul away these stone blocks and carry them over to the stockpile zone that we have designated. So the next thing our people will do will be now finishing these rooms so everybody has a place to sleep at. Since I'm unhappy that one bed is not finished yet, I'm selecting Emanuel, right click that, and whenever you right click a unfinished blueprint like that, you get to prioritize the work because I really want him to finish that bed. So we're going to do this. Over here we have the speed types. Hot keys for that are one, two, and three. I use that a ton. So here we go. Now everybody has a bed and this is pretty good. They are sleeping under the stars tonight, but I think that doesn't, that doesn't uh, bother them too much. Food-wise, we have more than enough packaged survival meals to exist for now but this won't last forever. So for today, we're just going to finish these rooms. During the nighttime, you can't really do much more than just uh, watch your people sleep. And 
you can't really you can assign them to work but it's not that much of a wise choice if you want to get do your do your builders a little bit of a favor there's one thing you can do as you see here Emmanuel is a really good constructor but he's really bad with plans to alleviate that a little bit we can trick Pi into helping Emmanuel a little bit here since Pi is our plants dude you go into the orders menu and then you go into the cut plants thing and now we designate everything inside these rooms to be cut because at the end of the day every tree needs to be removed before we can build that roofing and what Pi now will do is cut all these plants because I configured Pi to prefer always the, uh, the plant cutting work above everything else and now he will prepare eventually the areas for Emmanuel so that Emmanuel doesn't uh, waste that much time with the work he does he's not good at because he will chop those trees if he has to as you see here but this is a neat little trick to make the work of your constructors a little bit easier okay so that was the first episode there's tons of things more to explain and I haven't even touched the menus of my colonists yet so we're going to, I'm going to explain all these things like needs and and all the things across the next episode so don't you worry for today we have learned how to build a stockpile and how to build a couple of sleeping rooms for everybody these are the utmost basics to do the next basics we would need would be to create a place where we create where we cook new food and how, where we plant new food and stuff like that. The, the fundamentals of, of RimWorld are a place to sleep, something to eat, and staying alive by defending yourself against raiders and animals and illnesses. But we're going to cover all that. So for today, we learned how to create new rooms and how to keep our people safe. One last thing I want to talk about is the stockpile zone configuration. When you click these stockpile zones and push that storage button, you can select which kind of items should be stored in here or not. You can really, really go very deep into these configurations. You can exclude every single item to be on that stockpile. We're going to use that later a lot. As you see here, the dumping stockpile zones only accept chunks and corpses they have excluded everything by default so that's a perfect example on how these menus can be used all right i hope that was helpful for you thank you so much for watching next episode we're going to tackle food recreation and needs and let's see what happens in between drop your comments down below if there are any questions left just ask away or if you want to give me any feedback on that series i'd be more than happy if you did of course leave a thumbs up on that video if you liked it because that helps a ton to make it more visible and last but not least if you enjoy my content just check out my channel drop a subscription and turn on those notifications i do daily content so you won't miss anything when you turn on those notifications last but not least also down there in the description you'll find my twitch channel where i do daily streams and there's also a couple of links where you can support my project directly by patreon or coffee or whatever you want to do be so kind and check them out if you want to but don't mind if you don't the most important thing is you watching these videos that give helps me a ton so catch you guys next time and enjoy room world meanwhile bye bye